Jason here with a confession to make. I'm 47 years old, and for the last 16 years, I've been putting out the fretboard journal, which means I proofread pages every single day, and I stare at the computer screen for about 10 hours every day. My eyesight was starting to really suck. Like a lot of folks, I went to the local drugstore, it rhymes with Malgreens, and I bought the cheapest reading glasses I could find just to make it through the day. They sucked, they hurt my nose, I hated them, and they were pretty much disposable because every time I took them somewhere, they would bend, and then I'd throw them away and get another pair. Then I just discovered Caddis. Caddis makes readers that don't suck for people who own their age or people like me who are in denial about their age. They make reading glasses that have blue blocking technology so you can actually stare at a computer screen for longer than you wanted to stare at a computer screen. It blocks 45% of the harmful blue light of your computer and screen monitors. Best of all, they give 1% of their gross revenue to music education programs, and they look cool. These are real glasses, folks, that actually look great. You can go to caddislife.com to see their entire line of eyewear. I know this is a weird sponsor for the Fretboard Journal, but you know what? The founder and CEO of this company is a Fretboard Journal reader who plays guitar, bluegrass guitar. He is in our community. So I want you to go check out what they are up to. And best of all, if you use the discount code FRETBOARD15 off, you will save $15 off of your order as long as it's got a minimum purchase of $95. I am rocking the Miklos reading glasses and a couple different strengths, and I love them. So I think you will too. Go to caddislife.com, and again, the discount code is FRETBOARD15 off. I'll include a link in the show notes. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Verlindi. As always, that's John Rauhaus playing in the background. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors, Isotope, Folkway Music, Retro Fret Vintage Guitars, and Mono Cases. I owe you guys... You know, I started this magazine 16 years ago because I love guitar stories. I love hearing about them. I love writing them. I love sharing them with you all. That's why this podcast exists too. The reality is a lot of guitar stories have been told so many times in magazines and books, on podcasts, on YouTube. Well, I can guarantee you all, that none of you have heard the story you're going to hear today. Steve Kolb, no relation to Danny Kolb, I did ask, was a luthier in the early 70s. Like so many subjects in our magazine, he bought the Irving Sloan book on guitar building and decided to take his love for woodworking up a notch and build instruments. He found out about it via the Whole Earth Catalog. Again, another common thing with a lot of folks that we write about. What Steve ended up doing, though, was building around 30 instruments. We do not know, as of right now, exactly how many he built. And it sounded like half of them ended up with some of the biggest luminaries in the music world. Jerry Garcia, Robbie Robertson, Paul Simon, David Crosby. Crosby still has his. I just was emailing with him. The craziest part of the story is Steve made these instruments, and then he hung it up. He enrolled himself in law school at the University of Washington. He ended up settling down with his wife, starting a family in Southern California. He became an entertainment lawyer. He is still helping independent movies out with all the behind the scenes contractual and legal stuff. That's what he does for a living now. I reached out to Steve. Well, to be honest, he reached out to me first. He wanted to connect with Mark Whitebook, another subject on this podcast who he crossed paths with back in the day. I helped him out with that, and then I said, Steve, we should share your story, and that is the interview you are about to hear. What I did not expect was such a frank and enlightening conversation with somebody who really struggled with paying the bills, with possibly being on the spectrum back in the day, with being a perfectionist. Uh, This is a great conversation that I think everybody out there will love. 
I will post some photos of called guitars on our website at fretboardjournal.com on this podcast page. So if you get the podcast via Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you may want to head over there just to see what we're talking about. There's not a lot of photos of these things floating around. They're wild, crazy, blinged out creations for the most part. Uh, and Steve's story is just, it's beautiful. So I'm rooting for you, Steve. Steve is recovering from cancer right now. Uh, he does want to get back into woodworking, which is a beautiful thing. He's going to need to start from scratch. But uh, I can't wait to see what he comes up with. And I hope you enjoy this story. This is uh, what the Fretboard Journal is all about. It's what our podcast is all about, sharing honest real life stories that you're not going to find anywhere else. And I can guarantee you, like I said, you've not heard this story before because there's just not a lot about Steve online. There's just kind of a mention that he made some guitars for some famous people. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy the chat. If you do, please share it with friends and your friends in the guitar community or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And uh, if you want to support what we're all about, please subscribe to our magazine. Fretboardjournal.com is where you can do that. And uh, we come out four times a year, and every edition is filled with stories like this, although we haven't done this story yet. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy it. Everybody have a great weekend. Steve, thank you for doing this. You know, uh, I don't know that you wanted to be on the podcast, but I love hearing about sort of the secret history of Luthery and some of the unsung heroes, and you certainly were in that first wave of, of Luthery. So I, I want to capture your story because honestly, there's not a lot when you Google your name. There's not a lot about you, especially considering some of, considering some of the players where your guitars ended up. Right, right. Um, I was kind of out in the woods in Oregon in, um, 1969, we started, uh, my wife and I started a graduate school, at, um, in Eugene and it didn't work, didn't work out for me. She finished her a master's and I was looking around for something to do. And, um, I wanted to learn how to play the guitar, didn't have the money to buy a good one. So I thought. I'd always been good with wood, woodworking. And I guess I got the idea. I can't remember that was, what, 60 years ago, 50 years ago? Mm -hmm. 50 years ago. And um, it must have been that I saw Irving Sloan's book in the Whole Earth Catalog. Okay. That's the only way I can figure out that I, and anyway, I got my hands on it. And I said, yeah, I'll try to do this. And started looking around um there was a, we were 25 miles east of eugene across um by the mckenzie river okay beautiful area and um but really out in a little post office box called vida v-i-d-a oregon and i found a guy uh dexter johnson do you know dexter no Oh, you don't? No. Okay. Uh, he was fairly prominent in, in guitar and mandolin world uh, in that he started Carmel Music, okay. ran Carmel Music for a number that. of years. Yeah. So he was a buyer and seller of rare instruments. Um, he got into mandolins. He uh, made a, several, you know, F5 mandolins. Um, and I, I talked to him. I got whatever little bit of information I could get from him. He was 25 miles west, halfway between Eugene and, and, the, uh, and the coast. So, you know, you had to go a long way to find somebody. And somehow, and I can't remember, you know, 50 years ago, I found my way around some guy uh, in town who cut hardwoods. And uh, I bought some... Uh, walnut from him, some pretty nice looking uh, fiddleback walnut. And um, I built the first one completely with hand tools. I didn't use, the only thing I used that had electricity was when I got to the bridge of the classic, you have to drill six holes through the bridge to support the string. So I borrowed an electric drill from these guys across the river and drilled those six holes, but everything else was done with um, 
hand tools. And I, I don't remember the process that well, but like the backs, this guy cut it down for me to, you know, an eighth inch backs in size. And I just went at it with a card scraper and sandpaper uh, glued to, to boards, flat boards. It's been a whole lot of time. And I still got that one. Um, I just looked at it the other day for the first time in years, and it was finished in December of 1970. And I'm, I'm surprised that it was pretty clean. You know, it was symmetrical, which is a miracle. <laughs> I don't know what I had in the way of a mold that I built. How did you bend the sides? Um, I got a, a propane torch, and I um, clamped down a, like a three-inch um, pipe, you know, galvanized pipe. And um, I think I had someone in town put together one of these um, boiling troughs or, I, you know, I don't remember a lot of it. The, the workshop, such as it was, was in our bedroom. And, uh, and it worked, you know. And then, then I, I had a little bit enough, I could scrape up some money from home and whatnot to get a few uh, Craftsman power tools. Got a bandsaw, a um, table saw, a sander, belt disc sander, and uh, got some tools, some hand tools, put together a few molds. And um, well, I had one thing that I had that was really interesting. There was a thing back then called a shop smith, which was five power tools in one. It could be a lathe, a drill press, table saw. And I used the lathe function and I, I got a, um, some kind of a tube out of wood. I don't remember how I got it and wrapped it with, um, sandpaper. And I could use that as a sort of, um, you know, jerry rig, uh, thickness planer or thicknesser for my, um, backs and sides. Uh, Eventually, I found someone in an industrial park someplace that had a, one of the big industrial drum sanders. And back then, you know, those were monster, um, you know, it would have been five, ten thousand dollars in 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 that, you know, money that year. So I couldn't afford that. Uh, and from there I I built guitars. The next four or five, I've got to say, were pretty crude. Uh, I don't remember much about them. I think I um, came down here to Los Angeles and went to uh, McCabe's, and they took a few on consignment. I think they sold through there. Uh, I sold one or two locally up there. What what style were they? I mean, did you have a reference of a Martin or? Oh Gibson yeah, yeah, or? yeah. So yeah, so I decided I'd make steel strings, you know, acoustic steel strings. That was folk rock was kind of my genre, you know, the the music I loved. Um, so I had a dreadnought model and a large. Um, uh, a dreadnought size steel string acoustic that was, you know, the lower ballot and the length were pretty much the same, but it, it had, um, you know, the classic shape, shape of a classic. I think a lot of people are making those now. I think Taylor has, that's one of their standard kind of models. And then I had a smaller one that was based off the classic form that I used originally, and that, that came out just about to be triple O size. So I made that. Um, I can't remember where, I, I can't remember where I sourced all the wood. There was a guy named Fred Gerlach. I think that I went down to San Francisco, and there was a place called McBeath, I seem to remember, mm -hmm. that sold wood. Anyway, I started gathering wood. Um, Made a few, realized that I was going to have a tough, tough goal of it sitting out in the Mackenzie River Valley. <laughs> you know, there, there, there was, there wasn't a lot of foot traffic out there. Yeah. Uh, and um, 
made some trips. I took one of this. This is uh, scratched out. So I finished my first one in December of 70, and I built in 71, 72, and 73. Okay. Um, sometime during the time, we, we would finish them and find a concert somebody was playing and try to go backstage and meet them. And this one, I, I don't know, is Leo Kotke still alive? Yeah, he is. We've had him in the magazine. Yeah. He's doing great. Okay. Well, he was playing someplace and maybe my mind's playing tricks on me, but we had a finished six string and I met him and I think he bought it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's my memory that he bought that. Uh, and I don't know what they were selling for them, you know, three, $400. And uh, then we went up to Portland when the dead were playing. We found their hotel uh, and went in the, the afternoon of the concert. They about four in the afternoon and they went and woke Jerry up. Uh-huh. <laughs> he was asleep. He came in, you know, rubbing his eyes. And um, I had a six string. And you know, I wanted to see if I could get an order. Maybe he'd want one. He just bought it right on the spot. Uh, it was kind of a, a strange experience. And then he kind of backhand gave me the, the best advice in the world that I never followed. He said, I want to buy, I'm ordering number 200. Because he knew that if I could do this, uh, that was my 10th or 12th guitar or something. And it, and it was pretty good and it looked pretty good and it sounded good and sounded good and played well. He knew that by the time I was up to 200, sure. I'd be a master. Yeah. And I should have, that was, you know, I didn't realize I was too uh, naive to realize that he was giving me great life advice. And uh, anyway, I, um, and then we moved around. Oh, and I went, I was back east once visiting relatives and we went up to Woodstock and somebody introduced me to Robbie Robertson mm-hmm. and he ordered one and um, he wanted a, um, uh, what do you call it, a Florentine cutaway, mm-hmm. sharp cutaway and an oval hole. Um, sort of the, the opposite way. This isn't the Django guitar, the oval hole is running up and down and south. He wanted it east and west. Uh, and then when we got back here, somebody from that was connected with Bearsville Music called us up and says, you know, we have a house here. Would you want to come in and sort of set up here? And I was raised in the East, and I figured, what the hell? Uh, I expected bigger things, but basically they just had a big old house for rent. So I turned the what would have been the living room into a shop and moved our stuff in. And while I was there, um, I got an order from Robbie, taught, showed his to Paul Simon. Paul Simon ordered one, six string. And uh, I built that, brought that down to New York to deliver to him. That was an interest, sort of an interesting story there. We, um, he was on his way to the studio instead of getting a car, you know, calling a car or a cab or something. I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll drive you down. And on the way down, he says, pull over. And there was Jim Croce getting out of a car. And he gets out and he starts talking to Jim. And, and um, he, he gets the guitar out of the mic bar. We were bringing it down to the studio. He was bringing it down to the studio with him and showed him and tried to pitch Jim to, to buy one from me. <laughs> And this was, I mean, really sad. It was a month before the plane crash. Oh, wow. Something like that. Yeah, really sad. Anyway, I got to meet Jim Croce. Um, and then Paul ordered another one that gave me, you know, of my 15 minutes of fame, I got three, hours, three minutes and 45 seconds of it. 
he he wanted a 12 string and he played it on Saturday Night Live. Third, third or fourth season, Charles Grodin was the um, host and he was the musical guest and he played Slip Sliding. And we rolled in. By that time, I was in law school in Seattle. We rolled in late one Saturday night and just sort of flipped on the middle of Saturday Night Live. And there, boom, was Paul Simon playing my guitar. So that was kind of a buzz for me. So in the span of four years, you, three years, three years, you, you must have you must have some talent because you got some big names taking and, and there were a lot of nice guitars floating around back then and not as many as there are now, but uh, you, you must've had something going on. I, I did. And I, and I didn't quite know it. I mean, I, I knew that I was good with wood. I, I am um, an odd personality and I kind of figured I could do something that not be very hard and you know, anybody else could do it. But I guess, I guess I, yeah, I did have some talent for it and should have stayed with it and didn't, didn't have any life advice like people get now. You know, it's pretty easy now to get people that can give you, the, you know, the wisdom of the years. And, um, but I, I got, where, where else did I do that? Oh, I, I got an order from Bob Dylan. He came. That that was, you know, one of the most interesting things. This car, I kept seeing this car out the window of the shop, circling around, circling around. This was in this guy, Bearsville? Or, Bearsville. Yeah. This guy comes up to the door and it's Bob Dylan. He wanted to order one. And he did. He gave me a post office box. We were there for, I don't know, a half hour, 40 minutes. And he was um, interesting. He was going through one of his various religious periods. And he wanted Talmudic symbols in the fingerboard. Would have been interesting. And he was going to send them to me, gave me a post office box with corresponding once or twice. But then we left Bearsville and then I never heard from him again. So. <laughs> were you were you at all starstruck? I mean, you're just a guy from Backwoods, Oregon, kind of living the whole earth dream, and then next thing you know, you're kind of Selling your guitars to your heroes. Yeah, I was. I was to a certain extent. And but I also, you know, I also knew that that you had to to uh had to make a living. And what I saw, what I finally saw at the end of it was that I was working, you know, seven days a week, ten hours a day, keep up to maybe if I got really tooled up and got a lot of jigs and, and um, it was all set up that I could maybe make, you know, 12, 15 a year. And um, I realized that I had to, I had to um, make a calculation. The only way that I could make that into a living, you know, rather than looking forward to struggling my whole life and barely staying above water was if I became that one guy, you know, that, that one person out of, and I knew there were other guitar makers and other talented guitar makers around then just starting. Um, but I would be the one guy where they would sell for, you know, back then $10,000 each, you know, because I had the name or the other thing I would do was raise capital and start a small factory. I think, could be wrong, but I think Santa Cruz was up and running at that time. Mm -hmm. Around then, yeah. And, and Larry Bay, I think, in um, Ontario was up, and they had small places that I think were probably turning out a uh, hundred a year or so. Or I don't know if they had that many, but they had they had a small factory sure. operation, and there's a lot of those around now. Like, um, what's the father and son that all? At all, yeah. Well, they're they're smaller now, but there's certainly the Callings and the Santa Cruz of the world are are doing great. Yeah, especially this year. And um, and I didn't know how, and I didn't know how to go approach people. What I did, what I thought would be my opportunity, 
was when I was in Bearsville, I, uh, I, I had this concept of putting together a big shop with, you know, heavy industrial machinery, you know, top-notch um, machinery and having um, like pods around it for called wood and music where there would be woodworkers and uh, instrument makers. And I, I, I pitched it not very well to Albert Grossman who kind of shot me down. He, he was a kind of a malevolent force, not, not a nice human being. And, um, it sort of, they had sort of said, you know, they'd do something there to help. And then he just shot it down. He said, where are you going to get the money for that? Because he had the land and, and uh, I realized, and I didn't, I didn't know at that time, it's like people now that pitch, um, you know, pitch in Silicon Valley or whatever yeah. it is, startups. Yeah, no is when you really start working hard. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so that sort of ended the dream. And I don't know, like I said, I was an odd personality. I was certainly so, on the spectrum of that. I, I think I was very much as a kid. Got it. And uh, I just said, well, I'll do something else. And I had a college degree. Not that, you know, it was history degree. What are you going to do with a history degree? Um, and uh, so I, we came out here and uh, for a year. And my wife went back to get a um, master's in psychology. And I didn't know what I was going to do. So I decided I would apply to law school. And um, I did real well on the um, LSAT. Yeah. So, uh, and while I was here, I worked at Westwood Music for um, about nine months. I was up in the shop with John Carruthers was running the shop. Yeah. You know, you probably know John. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, very talented uh, uh, repairman. He was doing some building, mostly electrics. And I ran in while I was there, I had one or two that ran through the store. I had a, a classic guitar that Fred sold for me to Kenny Rogers. Fred Wallach, he uh -huh. sold it. So it was another person that ended up with one of my guitars. But you were pretty, and, pretty much uh, done building at this point, right? You were just... I was done building. Yeah. Yeah, I was oh. done. And I, and I learned um, I learned a lot, you know, several things from John, but he was not a, 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 a luthier per se. You know, he was not a, at least not an acoustic guitar luthier. But I still learned a lot. And realized that that um, if I was ever going to be really good, I'd have to go back and you know tramp this around or you know visit people in their shops. Uh, and the the guys around at that time who were who were building were prominent were uh, Mark and David Young, yeah. David Russell Young. Yeah. So I never met David. I didn't meet Mark once. Uh, and what, what I saw when I, when I talked to him, very much uh, mind of a craftsman was in sync. I began to see that um, I was part of a, of a community or, or a cohort of people to think a certain way. Yeah. And um, anyway, I, I never went to law school. I was never as serious as I should have been about being a lawyer. Otherwise, I would have been retired 10 years ago okay. and have a spectacular shop. <laughs> anyway, I, I kept some wood. I have a bit of wood. And uh, stupidly, I sold, sold some of the best stuff off about um, 20 years ago. I was thinking that I wasn't going to ever do it again. And then what happened was um, 
in December of, no, excuse me, July of 19, I was diagnosed with leukemia. Oh, sorry. Which was stunner. Yeah. And you know, nobody wants to get cancer, but I was lucky in that um, the strain of, of leukemia, there's a lot of different ones. The strain I had was possible to cure with a bone marrow transplant. So I had that last January of mid January of 20 at the bone marrow transplant and I'm still recovering and, you know, knock wood, it's, uh, everything's been clean so far. Congratulations. Amazing. Yeah. You know, you know, I have, I have a friend who's neighbor who's had one 15 years ago and he's been fine. Another friend who had one in 1999, he's fine. Um, so I figured, and when you come out the other side of something like that, you really begin to take stock of your life and what do you want to do with it. And I realized that even though I'm going to be stuck lawyering until I'm 90, if I live that long, <laughs> to, to, to pay bills, we have a house and we still have a mortgage and all that stuff. Um, but we have a garage. And so in a couple of years ago, my wife started getting me power tools for my birthday because I was watching um, these Saturday morning TV shows, woodworking shows. And I was kind of like, I become like a vegetable. My mouth drops and I'm watching them build stuff. And while I was recovering, I started discovering YouTube videos and all these questions I have. I want to get back into guitar making about um, setting the neck it was still the best way to do it. it was a mystery to me. Um, and then I, I came across videos for, you know, guitar build videos. And there's some people doing spectacular work out there. going to Mike Greenfield. Oh, yeah. And, and there's a lot. And then I got into then just couple months ago, I discovered all these woodworking videos. Mm -hmm. So now my, my passion to get started, I want to get started. I'm going to have to get new molds. I guess you can buy those from Stumac and Luthier Mercantile. You know, I need, need tools, jigs, fixtures. I don't want to go, you know, what, what I did was really very, my, my um, arsenal of tools was pretty crude. When I built and I'm surprised now I'm kind of stunned that I could, could have gotten through what I did with those kinds of tools and funky molds and, and, uh, but I did it, but I would want to do it right this time and, um, start chasing perfection again, which you know, that was another problem, by the way, that one of the reasons I quit is, I was always chasing perfection, which is a real trap because yeah. uh, you can't be perfect. Yeah. And especially with my level of tooling, I couldn't have the level of precision. That was one of the things I remember when I met Mark, he talked about it. We were talking about, you know, the value of hand tools and doing it, putting your hands on it. And he's, he had said something, you know, the more tooled up you are, the better the instrument is. And I had been thinking that all along. Uh, so I, I want to get, um, want to get to a point of, I, I can scare up some wood. I, I've got some wood in my attic. I can't go up in my attic now for another few months until my immune system comes around sure. to see what I've got up there. Yeah. Now I've got one or two sets of good Brazilian that I'll try to save when I'm good. You know, if, if I can make a few and, and get some, uh, get my muscle memory back. I'll um, give those to my grandchildren. Love it. How, and how many guitars do you think you made? Thing, there's a book up there someplace in storage. I think in the 20s, 28 or so, maybe. So you, you only made 30 guitars over the course of three years, and most of, the, uh, like half of those went to really big name players. I know. <laughs> I, when I was, 
prepping for this, I wrote it down and I looked at it and I said, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> I, I messaged with David Crosby yesterday and he still has the guitar you made. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, anyway, my, my new passion is to build a Rubo workbench first. Okay. You know what that, no, those are? No. Yeah, there's, there's a whole mythology around those this, uh, 18th century workbench. And there's a whole community of a guy named Christopher Schwarz, who was the um, editor of Popular Woodworking for a number of years, written a series of books. And you can go on YouTube and see 20, 20 or so Rubo building videos. So I want to build that as the centerpiece to the shop and then start, you know, making guitars. And I think what I'd like to do is get some very, very plain wood just to practice on, you know, the cheapest unfigured maple and sit the top and just try to make three or four until, like I say, I get that muscle memory back and then hopefully build, you know, three or four a year. And if somebody wants to buy one, they'll come and buy it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know both you and Mark Whitebook ended up getting out of Luthery and doing pretty well for yourselves after you hung up the guitar thing. But I'm curious, when you were at Westwood Music or when you were in the music scene and you'd play someone else's guitar, what, what it was, did you think like, mine's better? <laughs> No, no, look, this was the other, this was my other problem. My other problem was aside from chasing perfection and driving myself nuts because you have to think in thousands of an inch. And no matter what anyone says, you can't work wood well to thousands of inch. You okay. can work metal. Yeah. Because that was one problem. The other problem was that I never really learned to play because I wanted to build the guitar so I could learn to play. And when you're working, you know, seven days a week, 60, 70 hours a week, there's no time to get a guitar and sit and practice. So I always felt like I didn't belong. Hmm. And I knew that I had the same mindset, like I could meet Dexter and we, we could instantly connect. And I, you know, I met Mark that one time and whether he thought I connected, I knew that I had a, my mind worked the same way his did. And, uh, but I never, I always felt sort of inadequate because I wasn't a player and I let that stop me. There's a, um, quote from John Wooden, um, never, Never let the things you can't do interfere with those you can. And I did. Mm -hmm. that. So the other thing I've done coming out of this, this cancer is I, I went out and I bought a Squire, Fender Squire, um, a bullet Mustang yeah. for 200 yeah. bucks. Yeah. You know, because it's got, I got small hands. And it's got a short scale length, 24 inch scale length. And uh, the whole thing cost me, you know, with, with a, an amp and, you know, everything, the whole thing cost me 300 bucks. And I'm trying to practice and I'm hoping I can get to a point where I can play, you know, three chords and hit the string I aim at. Um, and, uh, you know, learn to strum a little bit. And I do have one of my acoustics, a Brazilian acoustic, that once I, I learn to play a little bit, I can move over to that, so got a, you know, regular 25 and a half inch scale length. And even with light strings, it's not as easy to play as a super slinky fender. Yeah. So I want to do that. But, but what I, I, I came to realize is, yeah, I'm not a player, but but I loved the wood and I loved the instruments as I was making them. I loved the music. Um, and I came to realize, I don't want to go too philosophical on you, but go who ahead. I am, yeah. but 
but I am, I think, my, who I am is a woodworker. You know, I see these videos and I see the people who really love the wood and love the craft. And there, there's a uh, TV show, Eric Gorgeous. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with yep. that? Craftsman's Legacy. And you can see it in his, his eyes, his sort of wide-eyed appreciation when he goes in with some of those people and the people that love their their glass or their pottery or their leather or their rocking horses or whatever it is. And I'm coming to realize where who I am and where I fit in the world. And I'm going to try and become that by just working with the wood. Amazing. And, and if I can make some guitars and, you know, if I can get myself to, to learn to play a little bit, I'd love to play. Because I know the, the this one acoustic I have sounds really good. Yeah. Plays well. I, given your personality back in the day, and it sounds like you were your harshest critic, what was the most you ever sold a guitar for? I'm trying to think. I think one of them I got $1,000 for that was like D45 style. Oh my gosh, yeah. Wow. Um, it had, you know, uh, uh, ab on the sides, ab binding on the sides, on the back all the way around, even more than around the back. Um, I was never, I've got to get together with the designer. The one thing I was never happy with on my guitars was the egghead shape. And I want to go back and I want to find a designer to help me design something really simple and elegant. Okay. My, um, my aesthetic has changed a little bit too. I want to, uh, I I want to do, I had, you know, real purfling, big purfling. I want to go to a much finer detail. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope, you know, first of all, I got to stay alive. Second mm -hmm. <laughs> of all, I got to, got to scare up the money. I've got some tools, but I still got to get a, a joiner and a uh, bandsaw mm -hmm. and all the, the stuff. Um, you know, from Stumac or uh, Luthier Mercantile, whatever it is, you know, fret files and a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff to get. I've got some stuff upstairs. I don't know, in the attic, which I'll be able to unpack probably in the summer. I'll be able to go up there mm -hmm. and see what I've got and uh, start doing it again. That's exciting. I mean, damn, I. Uh you only made 30 guitars and look where they ended up. So yeah, where the next yeah. 30 will end up, who knows? Yeah. I hope there will be a next 30. That would, <laughs> that, that would mean, that would mean that the, uh, the bone marrow transplant really worked. Yeah. Yeah. So far it's working. So that's a fantastic. That's great to hear. And, uh, and man, I, I have to say your wife married you in the backwoods of Oregon followed your guitar dream around the country. Then you became a lawyer. Like she's been with you the whole way. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> she, I, I wouldn't have made it through. Actually, she put up with me all the, I, I'm not quite sure why, but we, we, we had a couple of kids and they both turned out real well. They turned out a lot, a lot saner than I am. And uh, somehow she put up with me. And, and if she hadn't have been with me this last year, I don't think I would have made it through the, you know, you, you need a certain amount of moral support when you're going through a, a recovery like that. Yeah. You guys have obviously been through a lot, you know. A lot, a lot. How long have you been I married? Had a grandchild a, a week ago. Wow, so congrats. Two weeks ago, yeah, first grandchild. How long have you been married? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 1969. All right. That's, that's 53 years, yeah. Incredible. Yeah, we were actually, I was raised in, in, um, Suburban Washington D.C. Okay. Went to went to uh, or went to University of Wisconsin where we met and got married, and then Oregon. Uh, I, I fell in love with the West and the woods, and the, but I was, um, you know, to be a real hippie, you, you, all you got to do is you know you go out there with a carving knife and you 
carve walking sticks or something. I, I needed a shop and electricity and all that. So I was never quite of the total hippie ethos, but. Tried it. I try, yeah, I'm still kind of the, you know, everyone considers me an old hippie. So when you hung up, was it, uh, you got accepted to the University of Washington Law School. Was it just like, all right, this is my last guitar. I'm going to sell off my, what equipment I have. I sold off the, all the power tools and all that. Yeah. I, I know I was done by the time we came to, um, to California in, um, let me see here. I was done by January of 74. Okay. And then we were, we were up in around New England for a while. And then we came, by the time I came to California, which would have been around, time I came to LA, which would have been around June of 74, uh, I was done with building. There was a little place on, um, I had a thing called the the Dulcimer Works, kind of Carmi Simon. Mm -hmm. And I walked in there and he said, oh, yeah, he did a little bit of repair, come in and repair. And then Fred lured me away over to Westwood Music, which was a good experience. I mean, it was, that was a place where there was a lot going on at that time. I was introduced to Jackson once in Fred's office. Um, He was not in the market for guitar, but, and, um, Chris Hillman had bought one. Oh, we went up to see, to try to, to sell one to Stephen Stills and Chris Hillman bought it, but he resold it through Fred there. I, I'm amazed all the players. <laughs> you know, I, I somehow I went through, I'd said I was pretty much on the spectrum when I was young, very much so when I was going to I was five or so, but I never realized what I was doing, like I said, I, I never realized what I was doing was probably a little bit remarkable. And like I said, I always assumed if I could do something, couldn't be very hard so anybody else could do it. So it wasn't so special. And, um, you know, you, you make a lot of mistakes going on through life. And I hope I have enough life left to redeem some of them and get back. And if I can build that Rubo bench and build a couple of guitars and build some for my grandchildren, um, I will have redeemed myself, I think. I'm rooting for you, Steve. Thank you, Jason. I want to see these guitars. Uh, Thank you. This was great. All right, that was my conversation with Steve Cobb. What a story. I'm so grateful that he was willing to take the time to tell it to us. If you like the podcast, share it with friends, share it with folks on your guitar forum, share it on social media, leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts as well. And we'll be back next week with a whole new batch of interviews. 